Oh man, I am so excited to share this message series with you all. Uh, it's something that I've thought about a lot uh, really in recent uh, months because what we're going to talk about over these next few weeks really applies to all of us who've decided to, you know, uh, put our trust, our faith in this life of faith. And even if you're outside of that, I mean, even if you're kind of cynical about deciding whether you want to become a Jesus follower or step into a life of faith, this series is going to be really important for you because it's going to help you kind of come to grips with some of the things you might face going forward. Forward. So uh, I cannot wait to share it with you because we've all, um, if you've been around the church long enough or been around faith long enough, you've experienced some of the things we're going to talk about and maybe nobody's ever told you what to do about it. So I can't wait to maybe take a few weeks to do that with you all. Uh, it's based on an idea of something that actually came out of our last series, Walk This Way. So um, I almost said the wrong link up here just a minute ago, uh, but for this series, if you go to tcat.church slash enroute, you'll be able to find all the messages from the series as they come out along with discussion discussion questions, uh, some ways in which you can wrestle with this content, maybe talk to somebody and maybe tell some of your own story and have your own story maybe shape them, but also get some ideas about what you might do if you find yourself in a place that's stuck. That's really what we're talking about. Let me back up for a minute. There's an idea that I told you about uh, in our last series, Walk This Way, that is really what I think this whole Christian life is all about. I think that God is actually leading us towards one very specific thing. And if you grew up in church, you might have thought that that might be heaven uh, or, you know, which is a, a gift of faith, but that's not what actually God's leading us towards. You might feel like it's being led towards being a good person, and though that's a side effect, that's actually not where the faith is leaving either. No, I think what Jesus is actually leading us towards is this idea of fearless faith fearless faith, that, that we would live a life in such a way that whatever we faced or whatever came our way, it wouldn't, it wouldn't get to us, um, that we could face um, un, uncertain times and uncertain circumstances, but at the same time, we'd be okay with that. Uh, there was a couple different stories that I shared with you in the last series where Jesus' disciples were facing life-threatening problems. They were in a boat that was sinking, and they were like, Jesus, you got to help us. And he looked at them and he goes, why are you so afraid? <laughs> right? Why are you so afraid? And it was pointing to this idea that, like, look, I, I understand. I, some of you all can't swim, and only a couple of you all are fishermen, but why are you so afraid? And I think the gift that he's pointing them towards is a gift he's pointing us towards, too, and it's, it's this idea. I mean, what, what would your life be like if you could live it in such a way that the things you faced, no matter they were really good or really bad or somewhere in between, you felt good about it? You felt like you were constant, that you had an anchor to hang on to, that your life was consistent. What would it be like for you to live that way? I think that's the gift that God is leading us towards, but I don't think we've talked enough about how we actually get that. And so over these next few weeks, we're going to examine some things that happen in our lives that may actually give us the opportunity to lead into this. But here's why. Let me give you the why first. I think God is most honored. He is most honored by our living, active, death-defying, in spite of trust in Him. And this word trust is a big deal. See, I think God wants us to trust Him. And I think every time we face circumstances um, that seem like they're trying us or that they're difficult or we're running against a brick wall, um, that God is actually, actually asking us, do you trust me? Do you trust me? Do you trust me? Do you trust me with this circumstance in your life? Do you trust me with this diagnosis you've been given? Do you trust me with this loss of your job? Do you trust me with the things that are going on in your family? Do you trust me? And while I don't feel like God causes those calamities to happen in our lives, I do feel like God speaks to us in those moments and uses them for our good. That something actually happens when we face trials, when we face difficulties, that actually change and shapes us. And here's what I think happens. I think our faith grows. I think our faith grows. When we face those moments, and, and many of y'all have been there, where you get the diagnosis, and the doctor gives you that word you don't want to hear, and in those moments you look back on them now, maybe they were years ago, or maybe you're fighting it right now, and what you realize was that God stayed with you through that season of time, and in so doing, proved to you that you could trust him, but also simultaneously made you trust him even more than you did before it began. I think our faith grows. And these deserted, these deserted, desolate places that we often find ourselves in life where we, you know, we made the decision to trust God and then we, we started following him wherever he asked us to go and somewhere along the way we ended up in a place we weren't expecting. I think those are moments where God is saying again, you can trust me, let me prove it. I think there's actually a handful of things that make our faith grow. Uh, I want to share a few with you, but we're going to kind of zero in on one specific one in this series. And so here they are. Here's the five things I think that make your faith grow. Um, practical teaching, 
private disciplines, personal ministry, providential relationships, and pivotal circumstances. All these things, I think, make your faith grow. Practical teaching just simply means exactly what we try to do here on Sunday morning, that you walk through the door and we give you something that when you walk out the door today, you can go, I can try that. I can give that a shot. That's, that's simple. That's easy. We really believe in practical teaching because I think it gives you an opportunity to put your faith in practice, to, to test yourself, to see, do I really believe what I say I believe? And I think private disciplines are simply those things like having a prayer life and studying the Bible and having those things that you do when no one else is looking. Those things grow your faith. And so that's why we're, we feel really strongly about small groups and getting people connected together to kind of support our study and our prayer and our work. We really feel really, really strongly about that. Personal ministry is another one that we feel really strongly about. We feel like when you, when you find a team, you find that thing that God built you to do, when you find that one thing that God built you to do and you're really, really good at it, your faith grows and you also get the opportunity to influence and shape somebody else. And so we believe that personal ministry, serving on a team, finding something to do within the church world is really important. Providential relationships. God puts people in our paths. I mean, some of you all have noticed this in, in experiences. I know I have in my, my life. God puts people in our paths that when they connect with us and we, we build a relationship with them, they influence us for the better. Um, that, that, you know, we, we met them by happenstance, but the next thing we know, they're an integral part of our lives. You know, some of you all, your story of coming here to TCAT, I've heard it. It sounds just like that. Somebody invited me to go to church, and I didn't really want to go, but the next thing I know, I'm in a small group, and here I am, and this is my people, right? That, some of you all, that's your story, and that's awesome. It's fantastic. But the one I really want to zero in on this week, or these next series, is this idea of pivotal circumstances. Here's what a pivotal circumstance is. It's something that happens that you can't control. And it's either a good thing or a bad thing, but it makes you have to make a decision. And a pivotal circumstance occurs in a way that actually makes you have to go, do I trust God or not? It's something serious. And it'll either push you towards God or away from God. It's something that comes your way you weren't expecting. It's something that comes your way that maybe rocks your world a little bit. These are the things that we face that are really hard. These are the diagnoses. These are the, the loss of jobs. These are the loss of family members. These are the things that are kind of traumatic oftentimes in our lives. They also could be really good things that, that, that are you know, pivotal. They make you have to move to a new city. Um, you, you accept a scholarship to a different college on the other side of the country. Uh, it could be anything like that that really rocks your world. And sometimes these things are completely beyond your control. And the question I've always had is I know these things make my faith grow when I make the decision to continue to trust. But these things are hard. And if you've ever faced any of them before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, when you hear those words that you don't want to hear, you have a decision in your mind to make. Will I trust God through this season in my life or not? And in the moments when I have decided to trust God and continue to trust God, I know my faith has grown. But truth be told, some of you all are probably sitting in this room, and maybe at one time or another as a child or a teenager or a college student, something happened in your life, and you were like, I, I think I'm out, and you hit, you hit the unfollow button on Jesus for a while, and maybe you still find yourself there even today. This is just like, how could God let this happen to me? How could God let this happen to the world? And those words slip out of your mouth, and you're like, I just don't think I can understand or reconcile this moment in my life that I am going through. Well, here's maybe the comforting thing, maybe not comforting, I'm not really sure where you might find this, but I'm gonna say it out loud anyway. A lot of us have been in those moments. In fact, I think that most of us who live a life of faith, if you live it long enough, you're gonna find yourself in that moment. Where like you made the decision and you're following Jesus and you kind of run out on a ledge and you're just following him next step after next step after next step and then all of a sudden you're in this deserted, desolate place in your life. And spiritually you're like, this is not where I thought I was going, and you know, relationally, this is not where I thought I was going, or whatever, and, and you've tried to make the right decisions, and you look back on it, and you go, I'm too far from where I was, but I'm not where I'm going. I'm just kind of somewhere in the middle, and I don't really understand why, and if that's where you find yourself today, then, then I have good news. This series is for you, and if it's not where you find yourself, I, I, I don't want to discourage you, but sooner or later, if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to face a season like this. And I want to talk about it. Rather than just pretending it doesn't exist, I think it's better for you if we just talk about it practically for the next couple weeks. And so there's a story in the Old Testament that I have always thought illustrates this idea so well. Um, and it's the Exodus. The Exodus story from the Old Testament, I think, illustrates this idea really, really well. Now, when I say the word Exodus out loud, everybody who's over the age of 30 thinks about this. Okay, you think this. Right? 
Uh, anybody in your mind immediately go, let my people go, right? Anybody do that? Everybody under 30, you have no idea what I'm talking about. And it's totally cool, okay? Um, but when I thought of the Exodus as a kid, every Easter, right, this movie was on TV, it was on every channel, uh, and we had to watch this as a family. This is Charlton Heston's Ten Commandments, right? Um, this is Moses, <laughs> Parting the Red Sea in the movie The Ten Commandments. And when you think of Exodus, you might think of that. And that's totally cool. If that's the only picture of it you have, it's okay. It's not exactly completely biblical, but it's pretty close. Um, and there's some pretty neat things that happen. Now, let me tell you why I think the Exodus fits this idea of pivotal circumstances. And then we'll dive into one today. We're going to do this over the next couple weeks. So the Exodus story is really the story of the Israelite people, God's people, the Hebrews, being called out and saved and rescued from a time and a season of slavery. The, the Hebrews were God's people. And if you read any of the Old Testament, from the very beginning, God chose the, this family, and from that family, he, he kind of created an entire nation of people. Well, eventually, that nation of people end up in Egypt. And the first line of the book of Exodus, which is your second book in the Old Testament, says, then a Pharaoh grew up, or uh, rose to power, who didn't know who Joseph was. That's essentially the translation. Joseph was really the last patriarch of this family, who had brought them to Egypt to try to keep his family safe. And so from 400 years, from the moment that Joseph kind of leaves this world and, and the Hebrew people continue to grow, Pharaohs put the Hebrews in slavery. They became slaves of the city, of the country. And for 400 years, they're in chains. For 400 years, they're, they're building tombs and pyramids and stuff for everybody that makes them do that. And they're just continuing to grow, this massive, massive nation. But see, they were a people of promise. They were a people who were built on faith. And God had centuries before the people that were alive at this moment, centuries before that, he promised, look, you're my people. And I have a plan for you. I have this great land that I'm going to lead you to. And when you get there, it's going to be great. And he used all these really cool characteristics to describe it. But ultimately, they knew where they were was not where they were supposed to be. They couldn't go back, but they couldn't seem to find their way forward either. They were stuck and chains. And so in the middle of this story, or I guess really at the beginning of this kind of uh, understanding of the situation they're in, God calls this guy, well not literally this guy, but, but Moses, God asked Moses, uh, who had been a Hebrew himself, but had a uh, uh, by miraculous nature, ended up in the palace, living as a prince of Egypt under the Pharaoh himself, kind of in his home, and, um, and it considered to be like one of the great leaders of their people, but he always had a foot in both worlds. He, he was always somebody who knew he lived in the Egyptian world, but he, he just had this call, this deep desire to his family in the, Hebrew, in the Hebrew world, right? So Moses ends up like being overcome with rage in this moment where he sees this Egyptian guard beating up a bunch of Hebrews. And so Moses, the hero of our story, runs over and kills the Egyptian guard. Now, just for context, Moses becomes one of the greatest leaders in, in Hebrew history, in, in Israel history. In fact, we probably wouldn't be here if not for Moses. So if you think your story is too rough, God can use you no matter what you've come from and no matter what you've done. God can give you mercy and grace, and Mer Moses is the perfect example of that. But fast forward a little bit. So all this stuff happens. Um, God tells Moses to go back and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh says no. They fight about it. There's all these plagues, like frogs start raining from the sky, chaos, crazy stuff. Okay, finally, 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 Pharaoh decides to let the people go. So Moses leads this entire nation, two million people, out of Egypt and towards the Red Sea, which is kind of this, this, this boundary between Egypt and the land that God had promised to this group of people. They cross the sea miraculously, like Moses, this is the moment he lifts up his staff, and the water parts, and they all walk across the dry land um, the, on, the, on the bottom of the river, and they end up on the other side. And that's where we're going to pick up for the next four weeks, okay? So they've made it out of Egypt. They've come to this place. They sing a song. This, this woman named Miriam, like, comes up with a song. They just sing on the side of the riverbank, which must be really cool to be able to do that, but whatever. They sing a song, and then they go, okay, time to go to the promised land. But here's the crazy thing. See, when they looked back on this moment, they knew this was the pivotal moment. Uh, in fact, after this book, Moses wrote, write down, wrote, excuse me, writes several different books of history. And in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses said of this moment, this is what he said, he brought us in, he brought us out from, he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to our ancestors. So they're standing on the side of this riverbank 
feeling this massive weight of excitement and, and emotion that they're going where they're supposed to go and that God really did remember them and they feel this like mountaintop faith experience. And if you've been there in this moment where maybe you decided to trust God for the very first time and you took those first few small steps into faith, you know what that feels like, right? It's exciting, it's energetic, you feel like your life is finally lining up, that the, the, all the pieces that have been floating around came together to make sense. And that's what this entire group of people, two million of them standing out on the riverbank, they feel that energy of that moment. But something really interesting happens. This is fascinating to me, and as long as I've studied this book and as long as I've studied this story, it's taken me a really long time to understand why what's about to happen happened, but here's what it is. This is what it says in Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. Now let me explain what this means because I don't know how many of y'all are geography majors, but you probably have no idea what this means. Let me show you, okay? So this is a map of what Egypt looked like. Egypt was over here. Um, Mount Sinai is down here. This is the promised land, all that over there. Okay, so everything on the you know, left side of your screen, that's where they're supposed to go. Instead of going like, whoop, right up here, they turn due south, and they run way down here. And when they do that, all this crazy stuff happens. They run out of food. They get to this water that they're so thirsty for, and it's full of bitterness. They, they get attacked by people. They, they end up at the mountain of God, and they're so frustrated with God, they decide to build idols and stuff. Like, it's a crazy, crazy circumstance. They were singing praises and writing songs for God here. But just like 14 days later, they're like, do we really trust this guy? Should we go back to Egypt, you know? And in fact, at one point, they say, Maybe we should, just, you know, we, we had more food when we were in Egypt. We had more food when we were in chains. We, we had a better life when we were in chains. And this whole argument breaks out. Like, why would you want to go back to slavery? Moses is arguing with his people, and God is trying to share with them. But, but the thing was, and, and this is where I think this really becomes spiritually applicable for us. We oftentimes have enough faith to step out of the mess we found ourselves in. But to fully get where God wants us to go, sometimes there's other things that have to happen in our lives, and we don't quite have enough faith to make those happen. And I think sometimes the experiences in our lives, metaphorically speaking for just a minute, this is the only metaphor I'm going to use, but when we move from our Egypt towards our promised land, that satisfying life, that, that life of faith, that newness that we're trying to seek, that, that pathway to follow, when, when we move from Egypt towards our promised land, sometimes the things that happen in between are really hard, and those hard things, oftentimes we stop before we get where we're supposed to go. We stop too soon. And I've been guilty of that in my own faith. I've been guilty of that in my own walk, that, that I had enough faith to get out of Egypt, but I didn't have enough faith to get myself to the promised land. And that's what I want to talk about with you for just a few weeks, is what happens in those moments. You see, it says that God led the people. God led the people by the desert road, <laughs> toward the Red Sea, through the desert. He led them through the desert. He decided to turn them south from this land of Egypt that was like trees, palm trees, and grass, and wonderful stuff, and he led them by this desert road through the Red Sea. And here's the truth that illustrates for us. You see, God's path to his promise isn't always immediate. And gosh, I wish it was. I wish that God was like McDonald's and I could drive up. Maybe not this McDonald's, but like if you go to a McDonald's and you like you, you pull in and they, you order your milkshake or your whatever McFlurry and you get to the window and they just hand it to you immediately. Gosh, wouldn't it be so good if God's promise was like that? And I think I grew up hoping and praying and thinking that it was and I blinded myself to that quite a bit that the second, the moment things didn't quite go the way I thought they were supposed to go, I was ready to hit the eject button on God. But his path to his promise isn't always immediate. Sometimes we find ourselves in the desert. But you're not stuck. This is the spiritual truth that is so, so important. You're not stuck you're still en route. You're just not there yet. And there's something that happens in those desert moments that makes you prepared for whatever's coming next. And the sheer fact that God decided for this to happen for his people means that they, did not, they weren't ready to live into the promise that he had for them and he was going to help them get ready. Now, there's a little difference in their story, okay? Because for them, God was literally, his presence was with them. There's this pill of fire and, pill, not a pillow, pillar of fire. And they're leading him and he's speaking to him in thunder and lightning. And we don't get any of that. 
okay? We don't get that. But God still led them through this time, and God still leads us through these times we're in as well. We just have the gift of him speaking to us through the Holy Spirit rather than through this great big pillar of fire. See, here's the thing. There's some lessons that can only be learned in the in-between, I don't want to sugarcoat that for you. Like, and I don't, I don't expect you to fully grasp that. And some of y'all may not even like to hear that. But I'm telling you the truth because I feel like you deserve to hear what the truth is. Sometimes there's lessons that can only be learned in the in-between. And if God has a promise for your life, if God has a hope for your life, he's going to prepare you to live into that. And sometimes that preparation is not easy. It's just not. Now, does this mean that every bad thing that ever happens to us was God's design? No, of course not. That's not what I'm saying. But sometimes, when we find ourselves led through these pivotal circumstances, through these moments that we can't control, the things that came up and we don't really understand why, God uses those to strengthen our faith, and he's constantly saying to us in the midst of those, do you trust me? Do you trust me? Do you trust me to lead you through this season of time? See, the desert is the place situated between the promise of God and its fulfillment, and if you find yourself there, that's what's going on, okay? The, the desert is this place between what I am and what God wants me to be. It's this place of in-between that I'm, I know where I'm going, but I'm not there yet. And for you, it probably feels like disruption and pain and suffering. It probably feels like hardship. And you find yourself in a place where it's confusing and <laughs> frustrating. But the truth that I've learned in my own walk, and if you poll some people who have been around this faith thing for a while, they're going to tell you the same thing. The desert is not some sort of geographical anomaly. It's not like an accident that happened. It's actually a spiritual necessity. And one of the things that, I, again, I know, and I don't want to keep pointing the finger at the church or making assumptions that you don't know these things, but like I, nobody ever told me this when I was a kid. And so I'm trying to share something with you that nobody ever shared with me. Here's, here's, here's the thing. We don't like talking about this because it stinks. And it's a lot easier to talk about like all the great things. And following Jesus will lead to such satisfaction in your life. It really will. It'll lead to such great things. But I, I would love to think that you would be prepared for those moments where things don't quite go your way. And if you find yourself in a season of life where things are not quite going your way, this could be what's going on for you. Uh, if you don't believe me, think about C.S. Lewis for a minute. C.S. Lewis was um, still considered to be one of the greatest theologians of our time. Uh, he wrote the Narnia books. He, he was able to bring the imagery of God into reality in a way that, that reached generations of people. Listen to what he said. This was in um, The Problem of Pain. This was an excellent book. God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. It doesn't mean he caused the pain. He just reaches out to us when we find ourselves in those moments and says, hey, I'm here, and I've been here all along, and I've got your back. Do you trust me? And one more smart person, much smarter than me, Andy Stanley once said, we don't know what we actually believe until what we claim to believe is tested. And I and all, that's been the way it's been for me too. But we don't quite know what it is we believe until we have to put it into practice. Again, another reason why I believe in personal ministry, why I believe in getting in small group, because then you wrestle with what you believe. And when you wrestle with what you believe, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And I don't want to sugarcoat things for you, but I also don't want to be doom and gloom either. See, this is why the life of faith is so beautiful. This is why the life of following Jesus is so spectacular. Because it doesn't matter what you face. It doesn't matter whether it's really good or really terrible. God said, I'm here and I've got your back. I'm bigger than the circumstances you find yourself facing today. And if those circumstances aren't what you want, good news, there's something on the other side. This is what makes faith so spectacular. But because I'm practical and because I really feel like I want to give you something to kind of latch onto rather than just this big idea, I promise we're going to wrestle with this big idea for the next couple weeks, but I want to give you something you can think about, okay? So what is it that makes the difference when we find ourselves in the desert? If you find yourself in the desert today, you find yourself in a place where spiritually or physically you're just not where you want to be, what are the things that might make the difference? Well, I think there's three simple things, three simple ideas, and it really are questions, Questions we have to answer about ourselves. And the first one is, you know, it's all about what we believe. What do we believe? Sometimes when we find ourselves in the desert, we realize that what we thought we believed wasn't quite what we believed at all. This was the problem the Israelites faced. They were super excited, really happy to get out of Egypt and to lay their chains down and to get out of slavery and find themselves in freedom for the very first time. But when they lived into that freedom, it didn't quite look the way they thought it was going to look. And many of them were like, let's just go back to slavery. 
Let's just go back to Egypt. Let's just go back and put our chains back on. It'd be better than what we're facing right now. Now, they hadn't seen the promise fulfilled yet, and they hadn't lived into the covenant that God was going to make with them. They hadn't seen all the good stuff. They were somewhere between the promise being given and the fulfillment of that promise taking place. But what they realized in that moment and that tension was maybe they didn't believe what they thought they believed. And so when you face these desert moments, you're going you're gonna to wrestle with that too. You're going to go, what is it that I actually believe? Number two, what am I listening to, right? Um, what we listen to makes a huge difference in these times of desert. Uh, there's, a, there's a book recorded in our Old Testament uh, in the first part of your Bible uh, that's called the book of Job. And um, Job is like the biggest downer that you could ever possibly read, at least the 90% of it is, right? And he has a really rough life. But the thing that constantly kept happening to him was that he was facing situations where people were like, just give up, your life stinks, it's over. Like, and he was surrounding himself with people who were just saying, this is not going anywhere you want it to go, you should just give up. But he didn't. And he maintained his faith. Sometimes we surround ourselves with things that are telling us, um, maybe, maybe already justifying the feelings we have in our mind or, or whatever else. This is why I feel it's really important to surround yourself with people who love you but aren't impressed by you. That will tell you the truth. That will love you in spite of what you feel and love you in spite of what you're going through and love you in spite of your circumstances. When we surround ourselves with people like that, they speak truth in our lives and wisdom in our lives that we can't hear when people are just echoing what we wanted to hear. There's one particular case in the New Testament that I want to share with you for just a moment. Jesus is, is walking along through the city with his disciples. And the Pharisees were trying to set another trap for Jesus. They were trying to trick him into uh, making a mistake. And so they come along this portion of the, uh, of the city with as many sick people. And there's a man who's laying there. He's been paralyzed uh, his entire life. And the, the Pharisees look at Jesus and say, hey, why did this happen to him? right? Did, uh, did he sin? Did his parents sin? You know, what is it that's going, you know, obviously one of them did something wrong, and this is the way God's wrath works. Well, Jesus goes, no, 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 no. This happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. This didn't happen because he did something wrong. This, this is occurring so that the works of God could be displayed in him, and he heals him. And that's really a, a reminder to us that sometimes we find ourselves in these desert places, and we say the words out loud, why would God do this to me? I've said those words. God, why would you do this? God, why would you think this? God, why would you act this way? And we find ourselves like just so overwhelmed with this anger. And the truth is, Jesus' words to this <laughs> trap the Pharisees set for him are a constant reminder to us that it's just not how it works with God. God's not trying to dump his wrath on you. God's not trying to, to cast you out and make you feel punishment. God is your God. And he has mercy and grace and hope for all of you that is found in faith. And he's constantly asking the question, do you trust me? And the last one is kind of how we frame it. Like, when you find yourself in the desert, how do you frame it? Do you frame it in the immediate, the immediate context? And this is what I'm guilty of all the time. I think about the moment. Um, I'll, I'll never forget, and I've talked about this a couple times before, but I'll never forget that moment when, um, when my father passed away and I was starting to process it really in my mind. Uh, and I was just framing, like, I just felt like my entire life was just done. Everything that I thought was going to happen was not going to happen because this moment had occurred in my life. That, that the, my, the entire trajectory of my life was now thrown in a new direction because of what I was experiencing in that moment. And I think a lot of the difficulties we face in life, a lot of the things, the deserts that are existing in your lives, they kind of have that power, that temptation for us to live into that go, nothing's ever going to be the same. Nothing's ever going to be the same, and that's a bad thing. <laughs> Nothing is ever going to be the same after I finish this moment, whatever it might look like. Even if I make it through, nothing's ever going to be the same. And I think Jesus has a word to us in the midst of that, too. If you find yourself in the desert, if you find yourself facing these, these situations that you're like, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. And if I do get out of this, nothing's going to be the same going forward. It's a really, really bad thing. Jesus says this in John chapter 16. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart I've overcome the world. Take heart. I've overcome the world. And this is pretty inclusive right here. Um, all of our deserts, all of our diagnoses, all of our hardships, all of our financial struggles, all of our family drama, all the things that create deserts in our lives, all the stuff that robs us of joy in this life. God goes, look, hey, good news. I've overcome the world. Now, he doesn't negate the idea that you're gonna have trouble. He just says, don't worry about it. I've taken care of everything. And this is a lesson I missed as a kid. 
Because when you think about the Christian life just being rainbows and butterflies all the time, you miss the idea that when life happens, you don't have any ammunition to go against that. You don't have any context to how to deal with and process what you're going through. And I think God answers those questions for us so, so clearly. But we have to be honest with ourselves to actually get the answer. See, God wants you to have a satisfying life. He does. He wants you to have joy. He wants to give you peace. It's his promise right here. But the path there is through fearless faith. The path to peace, the path to hope, the path to joy, the path to satisfaction, the path to not being overcome by the circumstantial things that happen to us day to day, it's fearless faith. And if there was one thing, that if I could just push a button, right, if I could just push a button and, and accomplish one thing, it would be every one of you all understanding this idea. And everybody I know understanding this idea because this is what makes the difference. You're not stuck. You're just not there yet. Let me pray for you. Father God, I want to thank you so much for this, this, this idea, God, that, that you knew what we were going to face and you knew the hardships we were going to have in our lives and you, you knew the, the difficulties that could come our way and you said, look, I want to tell you what that's really all about. And you spoke this so clearly to us that, that sometimes we don't, want to, we don't want to listen, but it's so clear. It's so clear that when we face trouble, when we face hardships, you are the peace and the hope that overcomes. You are the steadfast presence for us so that our circumstantial day-to-day things are framed in eternity, not just in the now. God, I know that there are people in this room and people listening to the sound of my voice who are struggling with this. They're struggling with this. And God, I just pray in the name of Christ that you would bring your peace in unexplainable ways to them, but also that you would shore them up and give them boldness and courage to live into the fearless faith that we know makes changes and makes a difference in our lives. God, we love you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we go, uh, it's hard for me to transition this, but before we go, there's one piece of business that I need to take care of with you all today. Uh, If you're brand new with us, feel free to check out for like the next 30 seconds, but if you've been around for a while, you know that in January, we started a process of electing a group of new elders to be a part of our leadership team here at our church. What started off was you all made some nominations for about a month. Um, The elder team that exists now, including myself, Went through those nominations, contacted everybody that was nominated, made sure they actually wanted to be nominated. Then we interviewed them, and we interviewed their wives, and we interviewed them and their wives just to make sure that everybody understood what was going on. Um, And we prayed with each other. We prayed over their names, and we have two names, two people who've been nominated, accepted their nomination, and are seeking to become elders of our church. And their names are Jay Trim and Lee Williams. Let me just say... um, these two people are amazing human beings, and um, it was really exciting, I think, for me to sit with our current elder team and go, wow, can you believe who God has brought us, right? Uh, but, but here's the truth of it, and this is, what we wanna kinda, this is the part of our process we want to make sure of. We want to make sure everybody you know, understands that these people are coming into leadership and give you space to give us feedback. So over the next two weeks, there's going to be a set of cards. I've got a couple up here, and then there's some in the next steps area where you can say, uh, here's why I wouldn't let that person lead our church, or here's, here's something you need to know, okay? Uh, I want to give you the option for that. You may have nothing, okay? You, you might not, and that's totally cool, but if you do, we want to make space for that because these people get to lead. They get to be a part of making sure we're being missional. So um, over the next couple weeks in the Next Steps area and here up front, there's some feedback cards. We'd love for you to fill those out. You'll put your name on it, give us your information and the feedback you'd like us to know about these two individuals or one individual or both or however you want to do that. And at the conclusion of that time, if we don't hear anything in two weeks from now, um, or probably three weeks from now because we don't want to do it on Mother's Day, uh, we will present them to you and we'll pray over them and bless them and they will become leaders here in our church. So that's what the process looks like. Uh, if you've got any questions, I'll be camping in the Next Steps area. I would love to hear more. Thank you so much for coming to TCAT today. God bless you. I hope you have a really great week. We'll come back next week for part two, okay? So don't miss it. Share it with somebody who needs to hear it. <laughs>